Stay hungry, stay foolish. Today's guest argues that in the course of this century, the exponential growth in the capability of AI is likely to bring about two singularities, points at which conditions are so extreme that the normal rules break down. The first is the economic singularity, when machine skill reaches a level that renders many of us unemployable and requires an overhaul of current economic and social systems. The second is the technological singularity, when machine intelligence reaches and then surpasses the cognitive abilities of an adult human, relegating us to the second smartest species on the planet. These singularities will present huge challenges. Artificial intelligence can turn out to be the best thing ever to happen to humanity, making our future wonderful almost beyond imagination, but only if we address head-on the challenges that it will raise. We welcome expert on artificial intelligence and its likely future impact on society and best-selling author of many books, including the focus of today's show, Artificial Intelligence and the Two Singularities, Callum Chase. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Aidan. Good to be here. It's great to have you back on the show, Callum. It's been a couple of years now, and this book, Artificial Intelligence and the Two Singularities, argues that in the course of this century, the exponential growth in the capability of AI is likely to bring about the two singularities. It'd be great to get an understanding of what they are, technological singularity, and economic. This word singularity is worth explaining what that means and why people use it. It comes from maths and physics, and there it means a point in a process where a variable becomes infinite. At the center of a black hole, the gravitational field becomes infinite. And what happens then is that the laws of physics just break down. There's also an event horizon, so it's really hard to see what happens after the singularity arrives. I think it's a great metaphor for the scale of the changes that are coming our way. They are bigger than revolutions, bigger than disruptions. It's the superlative of disruption, the superlative of change. The word singularity has a bad rap in some quarters. Some of your listeners may have heard it. And there's the phrase, the rapture of the nerds has been associated with it. The idea that people in Silicon Valley, particularly who are great friends with computers and not so much with humans, regard the future of computing as being so wonderful and it will kind of lift them out of the human plane. I think it's worth getting beyond that. It's a really good word. It's a really good metaphor for the scale of the changes that are coming. As you say, I see two of these transformations coming. The first one, as you say, is the possibility of joblessness. Now, we don't know that this is going to happen. It might be that humans will be in jobs forever. But it seems to me, and we will need to go through the the argument for this, that it is at least possible in, say, a generation, not in the next five or 10 years, probably, but say in a generation, maybe half the population, maybe more, will become unemployable because machines will be able to do anything that we can do for money cheaper, better, and faster than we can. And if that does happen, then we need to figure out how to separate income from jobs. So there's a lot to think about there. Going further ahead of probably another generation, Again, we don't know for sure that this will happen. We certainly don't know when it will happen if it does. It's likely that we will create a machine which has all the cognitive abilities of an adult human, and that's called an AGI, an artificial general intelligence. And if we do create that, because machines can continually be improved, it will quickly become a super intelligence. So we will become the second smartest species on the planet. And that will be the most significant thing that has ever happened to humanity ever since we appeared on the earth a couple hundred thousand years ago. And it can either be a very wonderful event for us or a tragic event for us, depending on how the first superintelligence feels about us. So those are the two singularities. The possibility of joblessness is what I call the economic singularity. And the possibility of superintelligence is commonly known as the technological singularity. Let's focus first on the technological singularity and maybe discuss some of the terms there. And and what our plan for the listener is, let's talk about some of the terms for some of the terminology, and then we're going to go into the big questions that both these singularities raise. But it'd be great to get an understanding of AGI, ANI, etc., narrow AI, Callum. If we got a couple of those terms out of the way, that'd be great. Sure. So what we have now is artificial narrow intelligence. 
narrow in the sense that the best AI systems we have are superhuman in one specific skill area, for instance, playing chess or playing Go, although latterly some of them can both play Go and play chess, but they can't do anything else. They can't tie their shoelaces. They can't get themselves from one room to another, and they don't even know that they're playing chess because they're not conscious. So they are superhuman in a very, very narrow sense, which is why they're known as artificial narrow intelligence. And then, as I say, if we get to the point where a machine has a much broader set of capabilities and, and has all the cognitive abilities of an adult human, so it could play chess one day and then it could write a novel the next day, that would be an artificial general intelligence. And then, of course, superintelligence is where you get an AGI which has become more intelligent than a very smart human, and that's a superintelligence. So those, those are the basic terminologies. There's also the concept of friendly AI the study of how to make sure that the first superintelligence really likes us and hopefully understands us better than we understand ourselves. And that is what we need to do probably to make the arrival of superintelligence a really good event for humanity rather than the disastrous one. So let's talk about some of the other ingredients of both singularities, Callum. One of them is exponential change and the other then is Moore's law. The thing that's making all of this likely, some of what we're talking about or perhaps all of it, is going to come to pass, is the exponential growth in the power of our technology. And in the field of computers, that's known as Moore's Law. So every 18 months or so, machines get twice as powerful. And this was first noticed in 1965 by Gordon Moore, who was later become one of the co-founders of Intel. And when he noticed it, he actually thought it was happening every year, and he thought it might happen for another 10 years. And everybody thought he was crazy. And here we are now, 50 years later, and uh, 50, more than 50 years later, and it's still going strong. So when you have something doubling every regular period, then you have what's called exponential growth. And exponential growth is formidably powerful. It's easy to forget just how powerful it is. So here's an example. If you walk out of a door, proceed 30 normal steps, you'll go probably 30 meters. If you could walk 30 exponential steps, so your first step was one meter, your second step was two meters, your third was four, your fourth was eight, and so on, you'd go to the moon. But to be specific, your 29th step would take you to the moon, and your 30th step would bring you all the way back. Every step in an exponential process is equal to the sum of all the previous steps. So exponential growth is incredibly powerful, and it's backloaded. And what it means is that when you're on an exponential process, you're always really at the beginning. However much the past change has been impressive, it's nothing compared to what's coming next because your next step will be equivalent to all the progress you've made so far. So a lot of people know that the smartphones in our pockets have more compute power than NASA had when they sent Neil Armstrong to the moon. A smartphone now is as powerful as a Cray supercomputer was in, in the 70s. But actually, that's out of date. It's true, but it's out of date. A good toaster now has more compute power than NASA had when they sent Neil Armstrong to the moon, which makes you realize just how very brave those people were going, to, going into space with the aid of the smarts of a toaster. We've come on a huge way since the beginning of computing, but we're still only at the beginning of our technological journey. And it's this exponential growth that means these changes will be so dramatic because the machines we have in the future will be incredibly powerful. Now, some people say that Moore's law is dead or it's dying. And in some kind of narrow semantic definitions of the word, it is. Although really, Moore's law has changed a lot over the years. Uh, clock speed used to be a significant component of it, and it isn't anymore. Uh, recently, it's just been about shrinking the distance between two elements. Now, that's actually got some way to go. Intel and other chip makers say that they've got another 10 years to go, and they're confident about that. It's very expensive to produce improvements, but they're doing it. But there's also a lot of other changes that are coming. Chris Bishop, the head of Microsoft Research in Cambridge, uh, said on a show I heard recently that we're about to go through a sort of a Moore's Law for software. So software and also new designs of chips will keep something like Moore's Law going for a good long time yet. Now, if Moore's Law or exponential growth continues for 10 years, 
then the machines we have in 10 years' time will be 128 times more powerful than the machines we have now. And that's very powerful. But in 20 years' time, they'll be 8,000 times more powerful. And in 30 years' time, they'll be a million times more powerful. When you have that level of compute power, it's you know almost hard to imagine what, you would, what we'll be able to do with it. And we, we don't really know what we'll be able to do with it, but it's going to be impressive. So it's important to get your head around exponential growth, to bear it in mind when you think about what the future is going to be like. You mentioned about exponential rate of change, but the other thing that's going to happen is we're seeing more and more connected devices. Very few people, for example, today have invested in smart refrigerators, smart cars are on their way, everything's getting connected. There's a Wi-Fi signal available on most devices now. With that happening, there's going to be a huge growth in the amount of data available in the world. And that, of course, is the oil that's going to feed these machines. Yeah, so there's three things you need to make AI more and more powerful. One is masses of compute power. Another one, as you say, is lots of data. Although people are working on how to get AI to do impressive things on smaller data sets, but so far the most impressive applications of it have involved huge data sets. And then the third thing, of course, is uh, is people to, well, clean the data, but also to apply the right algorithms to the data. And those people are in short supply at the moment. We need many more of them. Um, but as you say, that we're going to populate the world with many, many more sensors, uh, bridges, cars, houses, fridges, people are going to have little cameras and little actuators, sensors in them. And that's what's commonly known as the Internet of Things. Some of the Internet of Things will be quite dumb, uh, but some of it will be quite smart. And, and the upshot of it is that the world will become more intelligible. So we're, we're going to be able to map the world and we're going to be able to understand what's happening in the world in real time. And that will make our lives more and more convenient. And there's a, a great example of this already everybody's familiar with is map services for when you're driving. So to know when you get into your car, what time you'll arrive is really helpful. It makes the journey a lot less stressful. You don't have to worry. And also to be told, oh, there's an accident here, turn left and I'll you know, get you around the accident. Enormously valuable. That's quite a nice little insight into how the whole world is going to get more intelligible and more easy to navigate. Oftentimes, we make assumptions that people know these terms. Algorithm is another term that many people don't really understand. Yeah, so algorithm is a really hard word to define. So it comes from a Persian mathematician called Al-Khwazimi, and it's similar to but different from program. So a program tells a computer what to do absolutely precisely. If you were to give a program to a computer to tell it to walk, then you'd have to specify exactly how it should move each of its legs every few nanoseconds. An algorithm is more like a recipe. It says something like, lift your left leg up and stick it a meter forward. And that's as much information as, as you get. And what happens with the modern form of AI, which is largely machine learning, and I'll come back to what that is, um, is you run the algorithm on vast amounts of data and the machine actually learns how to achieve the goal that it's been set. So machine learning is a, a branch of statistics which is fairly well established. And it was applied to AI in the early 2010s. And the landmark event, the big bang of AI really, was when Jeff Hinton, who's a British computer scientist who's worked in North America most of his life, managed to apply a type of machine learning called backpropagation to AI. And by doing that, he won a competition called ImageNet, which was an image recognition competition. And this was a real breakthrough. It was kind of an announcement to the computer science community that machine learning had been successfully applied. A way of thinking about machine learning is that if you are looking for a solution traditionally, you will have a theory and then you'll apply some data to it and see if that knocks the theory over. With machine learning, you get an ocean of data and you apply an algorithm to it, and the algorithm will find the solution in there somewhere. It's akin to pattern recognition, usually is a form of pattern recognition, which is what, a lot of what our brains do. So in some very rough ways, modern AI, machine learning on AI is similar to how the human brain works, although 
our brains are hugely more powerful than any AI system we currently have. You mentioned there Jeff Hinton, and you mentioned earlier on all the great minds in this. There's a lack of them. And by that, I mean a lack of the expertise, the 10,000 hours, if you will. But most of these great minds are working for the big players, big tech platforms. And that in itself says a lot about the future. Well, of course, the big tech companies can pay them a great deal of money. And there, there's been a lot of controversy about the tech companies emptying out the universities, although they are trying to not cause too much damage. But you know, they need the expertise and they're going to pay for it. And they're in a competitive struggle with each other. There's a an interesting phenomenon that the centers of AI development are two at the moment, America and China. And the British government from time to time tries to con itself and con us by saying that London or the UK is a leader in AI. Now, we do have brilliant computer scientists here. We have brilliant AI researchers. Uh, we have some really good AI companies. But we don't have any tech giants and we don't have anything with the scale of Google or Facebook or Baidu, Alibaba and Tencent. And I think this is a problem. I think Europe really needs to get its act together. Germany is waking up in a way that's not often recognized. The government recently decided it would invest a billion euros in AI development, which leapfrogs what's going on in the UK and in France, for instance. But it's still tiny compared to what's going on in America. And to give an example of the scale of that, what Amazon spends on R&D is half what the UK spends. So if you tot up all of the UK's government agencies, universities, and companies, all of what they spend is only double what Amazon alone spends. Now, a great deal of what Amazon spends on R&D is on AI, and that's not true of, of the UK's R&D spend. So the tech giants in the States are huge powerhouses of, of AI development, and then also in China. Now, in 2016, a system developed by a British AI team called DeepMind, which is owned by Google, but it's still based in King's Cross, they developed a system called AlphaGo, which won the game of Go, which is a venerated game in China, and it's thought very highly of in training military strategy. So that victory in 2016 was the Sputnik moment for China. The Chinese government sat up and paid attention. If machines can do this, then they have great potential. And they quickly drew up a plan for China to overtake America and become the leading AI development center in the world by 2030. And being Chinese, they motored ahead and they've made great strides. And an analyst has totted up all the declared investments. And it appears that if you take the local and national government spend in China over the next planned investment over the next five years or so, it isn't just in the sort of one to three billion range, which is what Europe's talking about. It's $430 billion. So Europe just isn't playing at the same stage as China and America. And we need to for two reasons. One is AI is going to yield tremendous benefits for humanity. And Europe has terrific skills, talent to offer. We've got great universities, great people coming out of them. And um, we've got great companies. And we're a rich part of the world. We should be contributing to this enormously important development. And the other is AI is going to be the most strategic industry. And Europe ought to have a stake in it. We don't really want this incredibly powerful technology to be entirely in the hands of America and China. One of the things that has come up recently, and you've been aware of it because you've been focusing on AI for such a long time, is the threats that are present. So for example, AI and the amount of data available on people means that we have privacy and security issues. <laughs> there's, there's plenty of what to worry about if you have a, have a mind to worry. There's privacy issues, there's transparency issues. It's very hard to know how machine learning systems arrive at the conclusions they do, and it's very hard to uh, reverse engineer them. People are working on ways of doing that. And there's also the question of how many of our decisions we delegate to machines. How willing should we be to let machines take quite intimate decisions about ourselves? You know, if a machine has all the data to manage our health for us, should we just 
hand over the decisions to the machines. There's going to be some interesting decisions to make. And there's also the danger of machines being misused. So just this week, a company called OpenAI, which was set up and is funded by Elon Musk and Peter Thiel and other Silicon Valley luminaries, has developed a system, a natural language programming system. It can read sentences, it can read books, and it then generates stories, generates articles. These are quite sophisticated articles. And OpenAI has taken the decision not to reveal how this system works because they think it could be misused. Obviously, there's already lots and lots of people producing fake news on the internet. But if you have machines doing it as well, the flood could be quite serious. So they've decided to hold back information about how their system works. And there's a, there's a lot of discussion going on about that. The possibility for misuse of AI is very great simply because it's so powerful. I was thinking about this recently. I was traveling recently and facial recognition, then you have your Uber, everything's linked to your account. And it just means that actually tracking, you can easily track somebody. And when you look at, for example, your Google account and it knows where you've been, places you frequent on Google Maps are in bigger font, for example, because it knows that you go there and it automatically assumes that's where you're going if you're going this certain route, which means that down the line that when privacy is an issue for people, I think some people are already realizing that and turning to browsers who don't track them using messenger apps that don't track them, etc., but when that becomes an issue, it means, for example, like what we're seeing in China, that governmental tracking of people and then, for example, even social credit become issues for the future as well. Yeah, there's a huge amount of debate. There's a whole field, there's a whole industry developing called AI ethics uh, with people concerned how we govern, how we control the use of data. Uh, should we all own our own data? Should the tech giants be allowed to hoover up all this data? Uh, should, should the AI systems work at the edge, which means working on your smartphone, rather than the data being uploaded to a server and the AI being applied to it there and then the answer being fed back down to your computer to your smartphone? Should, should it all happen on your mobile so that the tech giants never actually have your data? These are all very live issues. And as you say, the pointy end of it, the place where you see it in sharpest relief is in China, uh, where arguably the government and perhaps the people aren't so concerned about privacy as people in the West are, or at least as people think they are in the West. And so China has set up this system, which is only in pilot at the moment. It's called social credit. I think there's eight companies piloting it. But the story has been for some time that all citizens are going to have to use it. It's going to be compulsory in 2021. So what this is, is the government will hoover up all the data uh, that it possibly can about an individual, and it will give you a score. And your score will be high if you behave well. So if you don't go into too much debt, uh, if you don't write social media messages, which are criti critical of the Communist Party, and perhaps scariest of all, if you don't have friends who do those things, if you behave well, you get a high score. If you have a high score, then you can apply for the top government jobs. You can apply to travel abroad and so on. If you have a low score, because perhaps you buy too much alcohol or you gamble too much or your friends write nasty messages on Weibo, which is Chinese Twitter, then this low score means that you can't apply for the top jobs and you can't get a loan. And in extreme cases, you can't even get on a train. Your payment will be blocked. So that's the really quite scary extreme end of, of where this could go. And, and people have, I think, quite rightly said that is Big Brother being put into action. Here in the West, we don't have that. We have credit agencies, but they're not anything like as intrusive. And they're not trying to affect your political behavior or your political beliefs. But there is a lot of debate about the data that the tech companies have about us. Personally, I think that the real threat is from governments not from private companies, because private companies, they can certainly be abusive. But what they typically want to do is sell you stuff. They want to sell you cars and fizzy black water. What governments want to do is they want to take all your money and they want to send you to war. 
and they want to affect the way you think about politics. So governments can have far more aggressive and intimate ambitions on you uh, that can affect the way they use your data. Speaking of governments then, Callum, one of the big questions that comes out of singularity, both technological and economic, linked to economic, is the old idea of UBI. It'd be great to first get a definition of that and then Let's ask some questions about what's happening, some of the recent trials that have been in place, for example, in Finland, and hello to our Finnish listeners on Business FM. Those studies have actually come to a conclusion. So we'd love to talk about that a little while. Sure. So this is the thing that I am most focused on. There's a lot of things to be excited about and a lot of things to be nervous about in, in AI. The one I spend my most of my time is on on this issue of the future of jobs. So... There's an argument that with machines getting so powerful, they will replace humans in jobs. You can see automation already beginning, but it's going to accelerate. That seems pretty clear. We have self-driving cars, which are very close to being ready for prime time, but that last few inches, if you like, is hard to close. Google has a spin-out company called Waymo, and They have a lot of cars running around in Arizona and San Francisco, and I think some in Pittsburgh. And they now drive 11,000 miles between disengagements. A disengagement is when the car says, oops, I don't know what to do. I need a human driver to take over. Their self-driving cars now run around for 11,000 miles before they need to hand over to the human driver. They have a paid taxi service now going in, in Arizona, but almost always, there's a human safety driver sitting in the front seat, hands close to the wheel, but not not using it, except every 11,000 miles or so. And we don't know how long it will be before these things are completely ready for prime time and we start seeing cars running around our cities with no safety driver. When that happens, I think there'll be a fairly rapid shift to taxi drivers and truck drivers no longer having jobs. And... You can also see how in call centers, humans are going to be replaced by machines. Uh, you know, It may be that, that humans will stay in the same sort of numbers in call centers and they'll just do more and more complicated inquiries. I think it's more likely we will see fewer humans in call centers. And the same applies in warehouses and factories and probably also in junior accounting and lawyering jobs. Now, you can see these developments coming, you can see that they're likely to come in the, in the next few years. But for quite a long time, there will be other jobs that humans can do, because it's going to be quite a long time before machines can do pretty much everything that a human can do for money. But if machines do get 8,000 8, times more competent, more capable in 20 years' time, and a million times more capable in 30 years, it's inconceivable, I think, that our current jobs won't be replaced, replaced by machines. Now, some people say, well, that's fine. Um, they can take our current jobs. We'll create lots of new jobs, uh, which machines can't do. These might be caring jobs, uh, that we might all become each other's nurses and therapists, or they might be entirely new jobs, and we cannot begin to imagine what they'll be because the technologies that will support them haven't been invented yet. That may be true. We don't know. But it seems quite likely to me that there will be fewer of those jobs, many fewer of those jobs. And so we might find ourselves in a generation or so in a position where many humans are unemployable. And if that's true, then at some point, we're going to have to figure out how to separate income from jobs. At the moment, jobs provide a certain level of meaning to many people, actually not to a lot of people, but they do to some, but they certainly provide income that jobs are the, the primary way that humans get their income at the moment. And that may need to change. And the obvious way to change it is this idea of universal basic income. So every, every citizen, regardless of what they do, as of right, gets paid an income. Now, I think there's, there's a lot of problems with this. Firstly, the word in the middle of universal basic income is the big problem. We have to do a lot better than providing everybody with a basic income. A subsistence income is not going to keep people happy. What we need to do is to give everybody wealth, not salvageable wealth, but a wealthy lifestyle. We need to make everybody rich. And that ought to be possible. If, if machines are being so incredibly efficient, 
there will be wealth being generated, so we ought to be able to share it around. Another big problem with universal basic income is that nobody's actually worked out how to pay for it. If you want to give everybody a good income, you're going to have to tax the people who are still working or who have lots of assets. And the thing about rich people is that they're very good at hiding their money if you if you apply too much tax to them. Rich people pay a lot of tax. They contribute most of the revenue of, of governments. But if you push them too hard, they move abroad. They move to a jurisdiction where they don't have to pay so much tax, or they pay expensive accountants and lawyers to hide their money. And, and you want to avoid that. You want to have a future situation where the taxes are not onerous so that the transfers can happen. So that's the, the concept of universal basic income. And as you say, there's been a lot of trials of it, and a big one has recently finished in, in Finland. In fact, it wasn't universal basic income because it wasn't universal. As with pretty much all of the other tests of UBI, what they found was that when you give people money, it doesn't turn them into couch potatoes. This is one of the fears that people have about separating income from jobs is that we'll lose all sense of meaning in our lives and we'll just become couch potatoes sitting around watching Netflix the whole time. And that isn't what happens. When you give people money, it makes them happier. We really shouldn't be terribly surprised by that, but we seem to be. And usually they use the money to enable them to do more interesting things. So the issue about meaning and the issue about people becoming couch potatoes isn't the real problem with UBI. The real problem with UBI is how to pay for it. Now, I do have a solution for this, and it sounds completely crazy, and it's abundance, also known as the Star Trek economy. So the idea is, if we can reduce the cost of all the goods and services that you need for a very good standard of living close to zero, then the tax you'd have to apply to the rich people wouldn't be onerous, and they wouldn't all run away to the Cayman Islands. Now, it sounds crazy because how on earth would you do that? But actually, if you think about the music industry, you can see that in some respects it's already happening. So when I was young, it was absolutely impossible for even a rich person to be able to listen to any of the music, to all of the music that they might want to listen to. And now I have a 17-year-old son and he can listen to any music he likes, any music he likes, as often as he wants. And it's called Spotify and it costs £10 a month. So the only remaining piece of the puzzle is I have to figure out how to get him to pay for it rather than me to pay for it. <laughs> now, music obviously is a digital weightless good, non-rivalrous and so on. You can, uh, you can transfer it easily and cheaply. Can we do the same with food and housing and clothing and transport and so on? And I think we can. The, the cost elements, the biggest cost elements in, in producing most goods and services are number one, humans number two, raw materials, number three, energy. And what we're talking about with automation, with the, uh, the economic singularity, is taking humans out of the production process. So if we do that, we lose a lot of the cost involved in the process. Another thing is that energy costs are declining sharply. Now, you can't actually see this because we are paying more for our energy because we're still relying on, on digging up dead dinosaurs. And we're going to be carry on doing that for quite a while. But renewable energy sources are getting cheaper and cheaper. Um, they are not, despite what some green people tell us, they're not, on the whole, cheaper than fossil fuels yet, but they will be. And in fact, in 30 or 40 years, solar power in particular is very likely to be extremely cheap because as we make more and more solar cells, we're going up a learning curve, which makes them cheaper and cheaper. So it may well be that in 30 or 40 years, energy could be nearly free. So we've taken the humans out. We've got the energy cost down to zero. That mostly leaves the raw material costs. And by using artificial intelligence to govern the production processes, we can make them so efficient that we really minimize the use of expensive raw materials. And we find cheap to produce alternative replacement materials. So I think the economy of abundance is possible, and you know I've been thinking about this for quite a while. It's the only way I've ever heard of that you could feasibly separate income from jobs and provide a good income to people, which, I, as I say, I think I think you have to do. So in a nutshell, that's the picture of the economic singularity, uh, and and what I think it may well turn out to be the answer to it. A few years ago at a conference, a, a leading AI researcher called Stuart Russell said. 
in order to figure out how to deal with this this future of joblessness or this possible future of joblessness, we ought to lock a bunch of economists and science fiction authors into a room and not let them out until they come up with a plan. And I thought that was a really good idea. In my head, that translated into setting up a series of think tanks around the world to study this problem. So I set one up and it's called the Economic Singularity. I set it up with a, a co-founder and I persuaded Stuart to join it as well. Uh, so we are now around 40 people. We meet every couple of months in, in London and talk about the possible solutions to this problem. And we've recently published a book called Stories from 2045, which is a, sh a collection of short stories describing what life might be like in 2045 during and after the economic singularity. And by design, two thirds of the stories are positive and one third of the stories are dystopian. And we did that because Hollywood generally gives us dystopian stories for the very good reason that uh, when, the, when they're uh, making stories about the future, for the very good reason that to have a good story, you need jeopardy. Uh, and obviously, it's easier to put your hero or heroine in jeopardy if they're living in a dystopian future. So we are one of the numerous groups that are trying to figure out how we make the best of this automation process in the long term and and how we survive and thrive in the economic singularity. It's one of these things, Callum, that you and I have kept in touch because I really do want to shine a light on this topic because it doesn't seem to be taken seriously. And governments are missing the fact that exponential change happens so quickly. And I think that's the thing. They see it as a very far thing, a very far future, if it is even a future. And as you say in the book, politicians respond to public mood, but therefore the public need to be informed. And when we are informed, we need to start throwing our toys out of the pram. Absolutely right. Until very recently, uh, I, I knew of very few politicians who were taking any of this at all seriously. They all thought it was science fiction. That is slowly changing. I was in Dubai last week at a government summit, which was partly focused on AI, and I bumped into a couple of British MPs there. So I thought, that's a, that's a good sign. But as you say, politicians can't get too far ahead of us in the issues that they address, because if, if they do, then we think they're not paying attention to the things that we care about, and we sack them. So um, we need to, you know, all of us need to become more aware of this issue. Um, and if we think it's important, then the politicians will will pay attention to it as well. And and we need to, because although I don't think that we're likely to see widespread, massive technological unemployment for 20 years at, at minimum and, and uh, more like 30, that time will pass quicker than we think. And we need to carefully figure out what the possible outcomes are, which ones are the good ones, and how we nudge things in that direction. And that's that's going to take quite a long time. We may find ourselves anticipating it. So when people start seeing self-driving cars wandering around, and they know lots of people whose jobs have been taken by those self-driving cars, I think a lot of people will think to themselves, these cars are doing something that's really hard. You can't drive a car as a human until you get to 16 years old. And then you have to have learner plates on and so on. These machines are driving cars better than we do. You know, we kill 1.2 million people in cars around the world every year, and we maim another 50 million or so. And the self-driving vehicles won't do that. So they're out, they'll be outperforming us. And I think when people see that and they really get their heads around it, and that could be 10 years away, it could be 15 years away, they will start to think, wow, if they can do that, then how long is it before they take my job? And so what I'm worried about is that when that happens, when that when self-driving cars or something else perhaps is the canary in the coal mine and wakes everybody up to what may be coming, there'll be a panic. And when we panic, we're prone to electing very unpleasant politicians, and that can be extremely dangerous. So we need to avoid that. So we need to avoid that by having a plan, which is why I thought Stuart Russell's idea was, was so brilliant. We need to develop a plan and develop a consensus that it's a good plan and it will work in time to reassure all of us, reassure ourselves, when the canary snuffs it in the coal mine. <laughs> when I read that, Callum, and I, and, and I learned about your think tank, it makes total sense for government to have this. I mean, when you even think back to ancient Greece, for example, there was conciliaries 
with the government who spoke about possible futures. And in a way, it's like innovation in any sense that you back several futures, knowing that some of them aren't going to happen. But here, because it's the future, and you do call this out very explicitly in the book, forecasting by its very nature is hazy and fuzzy and foggy, and you don't know exactly what's going to happen, but at least you have to be starting asking questions. One of those questions you raise in the world of UBI, if we're all not working anymore, is what do we do? So what do we do for meaning and purpose? And you quite rightly call out that we can learn a lot from wealthy retirees, but I thought this one was even more important. The aristocracy of old, because if you think of the birth of knowledge, for example, or where knowledge and science and even art has been pushed very, very far, it was either by wealthy benefactors or it was by wealthy aristocrats who had the time to learn and push knowledge and push the boundaries and create literature and create beautiful art. And that was a huge benefit to mankind. Yeah, that's right. So when you say to people, look, in the future, it may well be that machines will do all the jobs and humans can do whatever they like. I'm always surprised that the first thing people say is, well, what will we do if we haven't got jobs? And People sometimes say, but jobs is what gives our lives meaning. Now, that's true for some people, but for the majority of people, it's not true. You know, if you're an Amazon delivery driver, perfectly good job. It's a good, very respectable way of making a living. But I'm not convinced it gives a great deal of meaning to your life. And actually, an awful lot of people, the polls suggest that most people don't actually enjoy their jobs. So I think we may be too wedded to the idea that jobs are a great thing. Jobs are important because they provide money. And in our current social and economic setup, they provide a place in the social hierarchy. They give people a position. And people worry about, well, what will we do if we don't have them? And as you say, there's two groups of people I think prove you do not need to have a job to have a meaningful life. And one is comfortably off retired people. I live in the deep south of England, and there's a lot of comfortably off retired people down here, and they're all really busy running around organizing festivals and bridge parties and dinner parties and so on, and going to the University of the Third Age. If you ask them how they fill their time, they say they have no idea how they used to find time to do a job. And as you also say, the other group is, is aristocrats who sometimes might uh, take an active hand in running their estate, their assets, and they might even help run the government or their empire if they had one. But most of them didn't have jobs and they didn't all suffer from existential despair about the lack of meaning. They had the most enjoyable lives of anybody in their society. And as you say, they were the people who contributed to art and science simply because everybody else was scrabbling away trying to make a living and didn't have much in the way of education. So it seems to me a false thing to worry about. What will we do? if we don't have jobs to fill our time. When most of us go on holiday, we don't all just go and sit on the beach for 12 hours a day. I mean, some of us do, and that's fine. But most people go and explore things. You know, we, we pay silly amounts of money to um, the owners of experiences to go and visit castles, and we go and wander around interesting cities and so on. Humans find interesting things to do. And if we had a the genuine life of leisure, which we've been promised for a long time and hasn't arrived, I think we would spend our time becoming the best golfer that we could become or the best mountaineer that we could become or the best painter or the best yoga teacher. And we'd spend our time talking to each other and learning and exploring and having fun and staying fit. There's a lot of things that we can do. I'm not worried about meaning. The thing that worries me about the the jobless future is money, access to goods and services. And keeping on that theme, so the more dystopian side of it for a moment is this idea of the gods and the useless. So the wealth divide becomes greater and greater. And we saw this in the movie Ready Player One, where the vast majority of Earth are living in VR worlds because their physical reality is miserable. So they escape to virtual reality worlds, they play games. We see this in in sci-fi like Black Mirror, for example. And that's a really interesting topic to just touch on. Yeah, this phrase, the gods and the useless, I nicked it from Yuval Harari. And it's the idea that there is a staggering amount of inequality because a small number of people have got all the jobs and own all the assets and everybody else is scrabbling around for scraps from their table. And, you know, you can make it as dystopian as you like. You can suggest that, well, perhaps the 
the very rich people who are served and, and get everything they want from machines, the gods look at the useless and think, well, really, what are you for? And they decide not to bother keeping them alive. Now, I think that's taking the dystopia to a rid ridiculous extreme, and I, I find that hard to imagine that really happening. Um, that's your next uh, Hollywood movie, man. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, know, <laughs> you say Hollywood's explored that trope quite a few times. I mean, there was a terrible movie with Matt Damon in it called Elysium, which was you know very much on on that theme. Um, but the serious inequality is certainly possible. I mean, people worry about inequality now, and of course there's inequality, but it's nothing like it has been in, in our not so distant past. You know, in, in um, Victorian times and before Victorian times, all the wealth was, was held by a very small number of people. And the people who didn't have wealth weren't just on a lower level of income. Many times they were starving. And, you know, we really don't want to go back to those sorts of extremes of inequality. We've got to figure out how to make sure that when we transition through the economic singularity, if we do, that everybody has a good life as we go forward. You know, we packed a lot in today, but it'd be worth talking about the idea of transhumanism and the idea of centaurs, for example. Those are probably two different things. I mean, I suppose some, some people would apply one to the other, but the idea of centaurs is that it's the claim that machines won't replace us in jobs. We will work in tandem with them. We do that already. Machines do replace us. They take us out of the workplace. And an example which has happened in the last few decades is secretaries. When I started work, there were secretaries in, in every office and managers didn't look at computers. Secretaries looked at computers. So managers would read out a message and then the secretary would type, in, type it in and uh, send it off as an email. Secretaries got automated by Microsoft Word and now everybody uses their own computer. So we will work with computers, but as they get smarter and smarter, as they get more and more capable, you know, they, they get twice as capable every 18 months and we don't, they will take over more and more of the tasks in each individual job. And very often we'll find that we don't need as many humans because so many of the tasks have been taken over. So that's the concept of being a centaur is, is human and machine working together. Transhumanism is the idea that humans should, or at least should be allowed to improve, repair, augment themselves using technology. In a sense, we're all transhumans in the sense that we all wear clothes. Many of us wear glasses. Some of us have cochlear implants. Some of us have pacemakers and so on. But these are baby steps compared to what we could be doing in the future. There are a few people wandering around who have devices attached to them which give them extra senses. There's a guy called Neil Harbison who has a device attached directly to his brain, which gives him an extra visual input. There are people with very advanced prosthetics with arms and, and legs, which can do remarkable things. In the future, we could have bionic eyes. So we could have eyes implanted, which have much, much better than 2020 vision. They have night vision and they have x-ray vision. All of this is just the beginning. Exoskeletons, which are pieces of metal that you strap to yourself, which give you extra strength. Again, the first baby steps in changes that we could apply to ourselves, which would make us much less vulnerable, much less subject to everyday damage, and in certain ways could make us superhuman. This freaks a lot of people out, and a lot of people think it should be stopped. And I disagree with them. I think that you know we are a species which wants to improve ourselves, and I think we should improve ourselves. And not just through AI, but also through biotechnology, we're going to have the ability to defend ourselves against disease and to make ourselves more robust. And I think we should take advantage of those, of those opportunities. One of the reasons I brought that up is, again, when you talk about this divide, a wealth divide, and maybe the gods and the useless, the gods will have first dibs on any latest technology, any latest AI, while it may be universally available, but obviously the prototypes will go to the gods, not the useless. Yeah, so for some time to come, that shouldn't be too much of a problem because what happens is that the rich people get the first versions which don't work very well and they're buggy and they're incredibly expensive. And then um, the, the producers learn from those initial guinea pigs, if you like, and they produce later versions of the technology which is much cheaper and, and spreads around the world. And a, and a great example is smartphones. I can remember when I first saw an, an iPhone, I thought, wow, that's a brilliant little device. I can't imagine ever 
shelling out this amount of money for it. And now, of course, I, I'd be lost without my smartphone. Uh, and and you'll see if you went to you know if you go to Nairobi, people are as glued to their phones there as they are in in London and uh, and Vancouver. For some time to come, all of these technologies will quickly disseminate around the world if they are valuable, and the rich people will be our guinea pigs. However, there might come a point at some point where the technology is so powerful that it really makes you different. And if you have these implants, if you have these uh, intelligence amplifiers, these sensory amplifiers, you do become superhuman. And even if you only have that advantage for a few months, because then it's the technology disseminates, by that point, you've gone on to the next one. And you are, and, and each technology is more powerful than the last one because of the exponential progress. And so what happens is that humanity speciates. You get a real case of the gods and the useless because the rich people actually have become a different species. And not only do they perhaps choose not to deal with the rest of us, perhaps they even can't because we can't understand what they're saying because they're that much smarter. Now, this isn't going to happen tomorrow, next few years, next few decades. But beyond the economic singularity, those sorts of issues do become a, a potential issue. And as you say, this is what think tanks are for, to discuss what if, because there's many what ifs and there's many ways this can go. I think one of my favorite lines in the book is, optimism like pessimism is a bias to be avoided, but summoning the determination to rise to a challenge and to succeed is a virtue. You are an optimist, Callum, and the book comes across as very optimistic, but you do call out the dystopian view, and it all comes down to what choices we make. Yeah, that's right. I think we should be clear-eyed about the real downside possibilities, but we should be excited about the upside possibilities. And there's really no point just being glum and pessimistic about the whole thing, uh, because then you never get anything done. Uh, but there is always this, this tussle between being unrealistic, being optimistic and being biased, but on the other hand, wanting to be hopeful and positive and see the great things that can happen and be excited about them and, and pursue them. And that's what we should do. Yeah, I know you do a lot of keynotes around the globe. Where can people find out more about you and your work? So I have a website, which is www.pandoras-brain.com. That's named after a, a novel I wrote years ago about the arrival of the first superintelligence on the planet. I'm fairly active on Twitter at, uh, at CC Callum. And obviously, there's my books on Amazon. The book we've been talking about today, Artificial Intelligence and the Two Singularities, is a combination of two of my other books. So I wrote one book about the technological singularity called Surviving AI, and I've recently updated that with a second edition. And then I wrote a book called The Economic Singularity, which is unsurprisingly about the economic singularity. That's also in its second edition, and they, they are combined in the book AI and the Two Singularities. It's a fantastic read, Callum. It really is. It's a great primer for anybody who wants to get their head around from day one, how this started, the history of it, all the terminology, and then all the major questions that come out of it. It's been a pleasure talking to you, expert on artificial intelligence and best-selling author of Artificial Intelligence and the Two Singularities, Callum Chase. Thank you for joining us. It's been a pleasure, Aidan.